Right. This is Julia Armstrong from the Culinary Historians of Canada. And I'd like to welcome you today to our second episode of Behind Every Great Cook is a Great Mother. John is um, a member of the Culinary Historians of Canada, and he is an architectural writer and the author of this book, um, which is uh, recently released from Random, Penguin Random House, The Kitchen, A Journey Through Time, and the Homes of Julia Child, Georgia O'Keeffe, Elvis Presley, and many others in search of the perfect design. And he is our host for today, and I'll ask him to introduce our guests. Thank you, Julia, that's wonderful, thank you so much. Our first guest today is Chef Doris Finn, and later on, we'll be talking to Marion Kane. So thank you very much for joining us today. Chef Doris Finn is up first. Chef Doris's fascination with food and cooking began at the age of seven, and we'll see some photos of that in a second. Her passion is fueled by gathering ingredients, cooking them, and then feasting on them with others. Chef Doris specializes in plant-based culinary arts, teaches interactive culinary classes, and does culinary demonstrations. Doris is currently working on her first cookbook, weaving her knowledge in the history of food to reawaken people to the endless possibilities of gathering, cooking, and feasting. After more than two decades of cooking, over a decade of traveling, Doris has made it her mission to help people rediscover their love for real cooking. Thank you, Doris. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me join you here today, John. Great. Doris, please tell us about your mom and how did she affect your cooking career? Well, my mom, oh, you love seeing the picture of her on the screen. Um, my mom has been my biggest inspiration since I've been cooking since I was seven, but even before that, being from Drush, uh, Russia and being Jewish, it is already very common in the tradition of the culture to constantly have food. So my mom would always bombard us with a lot of food, whether it was restaurant or fast food, but the best was when she would cook it and she inspired me to want to cook. And then the rest is history from there. Isn't that nice? What's, oh, so nice. <laughs> oh. So did you, um, what sorts of things did you cook with your mom? Mostly uh, Ashkenazi Jewish food, so a lot of Russian food, so a lot of potato, a lot of um, rice, vegetables galore. We had a garden, so we had different berries and vegetables, and we would make soups and stews. Uh, my dad taught me how to use the oven to do baked oh. and mostly animal products, and my mom would do mostly vegetable-based, so plant-based, meaning mostly plants, not plant only, of course. So we would do all sorts of things. Salads were huge as well. Every meal had to have a salad, whether it was fresh from the garden or from a store or a Russian deli. Um, a lot of mayonnaise, <laughs> lots of jams, lots of butter, lots of um, fresh ingredients as well, like grated carrots, grated cabbage, lots of fermented foods, whether it was the kefir or kvass, beet kvass, fermented beet juice, uh, sourdoughs, challah, uh, rye bread, um, sauerkraut, yogurts, and I imagine that the food that they had in Russia was much better than what it is here in Canada because of all the restrictions. Um, but 30 years ago, the food that I was eating is different than today as well because of everything industrialized as well. So the food was more organic then, and my parents also brought their knowledge from Russia, which was foraging. Unfortunately, not for mushrooms, but for berries and some weeds like dandelion and plantain, um, different flowers, they would dehydrate. Our table would be filled with all these different flowers so they can dehydrate and we could store them in the cupboards for teas for later. And we would invite lots of people who would always bring food. And I noticed that my mom never used recipes. So I felt like they were, my, both my parents were scientists in the kitchen. I would see that they would eat something raw and just look plain. And then they would recreate it into these beautiful, magnific magnificent feast. So that's where my fascination began. And they graciously allowed me to be in the kitchen, of course. And by the time I was 10, I was at home by myself cooking. And when I didn't burn the house down, my parents knew that I was trustworthy to cook the meals for us. And I started off with like eclairs and lobster and wedding cakes from books from the library. Uh, and then 
as I would travel, I would learn about, that's the kitchen that I grew up in, my little troll slippers there, and I would sit on the counter and eat the different jams that they would <laughs> I miss that house. <laughs> but so little... where, is, where is this kitchen, uh, Chef Doris? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Thornhill, Ontario, which is uh, just about 20, 30 minutes north of downtown Toronto. And today it doesn't look anything like when I was a little girl. There's no more fields. It's all houses and condos, but still there's some nature and that house is still there. <laughs> so how did you like this kitchen when you were growing up? I didn't know anything else until I went to Friends, of course, but I loved it because I like the counter space and I like that it holds a lot. And it's what I knew. We have a dining room just to the left of it, which is where we would have like the Shabbat dinners. But in front of that counter space is the regular kitchen table. I know you have a, a, an interesting story about your mom and, and the, your connection to cooking. And maybe you could please tell us about that. And then your road to, to become going into plant-based uh, cooking. Yes. Um, well, my mom's cooking uh, was made from scratch. And she, very similarly to many people that we know, would get ideas from friends or restaurants or whatever she knew from back home. And one of the things that I really wanted to show, she would use, this is a hokloma. Uh, so maybe you've seen the designs before of um, the long birds and the yellow, black, red designs. And this is just a cutting board, which we would use to make pierogies on and strudels. <laughs> that was extravagant from scratch. The rest would be just simple vegetable dishes. But I just took this from my dad so I can show this and I might make pierogies later. Um, and she would always, she would often make matzo ball soup regardless if it was Passover or not, chicken soup, um, and borscht. And her borscht was just as good as my grandma's. <laughs> borscht is good anytime, but this is the spoon that, that's very common in Russia. And they have ladles and ice scoopers and different things made from this design of the Hokoma. You can have salt shakers and um, cups and plates, etc. And this is, because uh, borscht is very hearty, this is the type of spoon that they would eat to, to lift a lot. Otherwise we use small little spoons. Um, and I never ate from this. I think I'm going to keep this. I'm not returning it to my dad. My <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to keep these things. But my mom would, she would really insist on family gathering, getting together. And she instilled that in me. And that's where, by the time I got to high school, both my brother and I, he's three years older than I, we stopped the family tradition, which is why um, when I started traveling at 18, even before, I was always drawn to going to people's homes. Across the street, I had... Um, Gujarati neighbors from India and every day for two years from 10 to 12 I 10 years of age 12 years of age I'd go across the street my mom encouraged me to go and explore all the neighbors their different cuisines and I would cook them at home but I never thought to write down recipes now it's just routine right your hands the, the fingers have gained intelligence <laughs> and I retained a lot of this information over the years of traveling around the world and unfortunately my mom when she passed away nine years ago she couldn't join in on the travels but I would continue sort of like her legend of sharing meals, inviting and encouraging more people to, to join us and to encourage passing on the knowledge of food and the importance of supporting local, sustainable and communal eating, which is so important. And that's what I've gained from her. And that would continue on in my travels. I would go around and see just abundance of community and people sharing from their gardens, taking care of each other's kids, a lot of bartering. Um, so I would, in exchange for food and accommodation, I would live in with people, be their personal cook. Um, and then I created a, um, a career out of, that, out of that, cooking as I would go. <laughs> and then it would just, four years ago, when I was 28, I just settled in Toronto, stopped traveling as I did, and just started to cook a lot. And I started teaching cooking classes in Northern India when I, in uh, 10 years ago, so when I was 22. And since then I've been teaching everywhere I've been going. And it's been the love of my life, teaching people, using the ingredients from the locals and seeing people get excited about the smallest little things like a zucchini spiralizer or a certain chopping of a vegetable. Like they never knew this. These are not things you learn from school. Mm -hmm. You learn from your mothers or people you meet or you make mistakes. Like after you cut yourself, you realize you shouldn't hold a knife that way or maybe the knives are dull. Um, so my mom instilled a lot of things, but then I learned a lot of things later. 
Thank you. So uh, I just have to tell you that Rosalind uh, typed up when she saw the board. She said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's some board. Oh, it, my goodness. Yes, there's a lot of them that are like that out there. And um, I don't know where, but I, I know when my parents moved from their three-story house to a condo, I wasn't home. I was traveling. So I was in India at the time, and I didn't think about um, material. You know, I don't know if you know, but when you're in India, something happens, and you get rid of all these attachments to things. You really learn about humility. And I just said, get rid of everything. I don't care. I have a backpack and my tools, and I'm good. I don't need anything else. And I came home, and it didn't occur to me to think about those little things. So there was a lot of things that were given away or thrown away. But things like these that are sentimental, I'm so glad my dad kept. <laughs> That's great. You know, unfortunately, we're coming up to near the end, but I have to ask you about hala because uh, you taught me how to make hala, and I know that hala is a big passion for you. So how did that happen? Your your interest in hala and making hala, I mean, beautiful hala. Thanks. Um, I've had much better. I'm getting better by the day. I just started making it last year, actually. Um, the challah is a traditional Jewish bread that's braided. Um, there's a whole history to all the breads, but challah in particular is just egg, flour, sugar, oil, and a yeast, active yeast. And it rises very quickly. It's very soft. It's delicious. You can make it healthier with different flours. And it's just been the traditional bread on Shabbat or on certain Jewish holidays that we eat. I would eat it any time of the year, sliced into sandwiches, grilled cheese, I uh, use this filler to make chicken cutlets and it just became the bread that we ate all the time, traditional or not. I loved it and I just wanted to share it now because I've been getting into baking just this last year um, and I've been enjoying playing with the dough and color is the, for me the easiest dough to work with because it's so soft. It's hard to kind of screw up <laughs> and you can teach it within an hour at places like where we met. <laughs> All I can say, if anybody out there, if you want to learn how to make hala, it's with Doris Finn. Thanks. <laughs> Any last thoughts about your mom and, and uh, cooking in Mother's Day, Doris? Oh, I think about it so often, and especially on Mother's Day, because um, she passed away two weeks after Mother's Day. And <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, and her birthday was like three weeks before. But anyways, within that time, like we really focus on concentrating on her and uh, my dad and my brother, we kind of just, we, we celebrate with conversation and maybe a meal and we think about her and uh, she never really had any favorite foods, maybe anything with butter and mayo worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, if you could please stick around, that's wonderful. Thank you for, for your comments and your thoughts. Uh, if you could stick around, we're gonna talk to, um, we're gonna talk to Marianne Kane now and then we'll have Q's and A's a little later. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, thanks. So Marion Kane. Hi, Marion. Thanks for being with us. Marion Kane has been a leader in the world of food journalism for decades. Born in Montreal, she grew up in North London, England, as an, and is now based in Toronto. For 18 years, she was food editor, columnist for the Toronto Star. On that beat, she chewed the fat with celebrities like Julia Child, Sophia Loren, and Nigella Lawson. In 2007, Marion left the star to pursue audio podcasts that were her live, lively series, Sitting in the Kitchen. And you can see, hear those on MarionKane.com. These days, Marion likes to be known as a seasoned food journalist. She's back in Toronto and loves to bake, especially baking cakes in her Kensington Market kitchen. Marion, welcome. Thank you for John for inviting me. Oh, no problem. Marion, can you please tell us about your mom and how she affected your cooking career? It was the only bond with her um, that I had the whole of my life. You showed the picture of her. She was beautiful, brainy, and buxom. <laughs> she was looker. <laughs> Here's her. I can see that. At 90 years old. She was still a looker, and she 
explained cloning to my brother-in-law <laughs> and she had a knowledge of flora and fauna that beats the band. She read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy in the original Russian and she spoke six languages. It was a lot to live up to as the only girl and the eldest child. But we had a bond with cooking and food. That shows the bond. You have the picture yes, on we the have screen. <laughs> I used to make vinaigrette at dinner. We had a salad at every dinner. I have the same background as Doris Finn. I'm Jewish and Russian influenced. Um, I, my mom did a lot of Russian cooking. She was a, a Holocaust refugee. It's important to know her. But she escaped at 16 years of age. She was the only the person who speaks English in her family. She escaped with her parents and a younger sister. They arrived via the Pacific and New York in Montreal. She learned to cook from the joy of cooking. I have a book. It's tattered and torn and stained. It has no cover. She learned in the 1940s to cook American food. And she has still had memories of her Russian Baltic background. This was stained most at the cheesecake. I cooked from age 14 and was an entrepreneur with cheesecake. I sold it to my teacher at grammar school for 14 shillings. <laughs> um, I noted the page of the prune, prune souffle. I used to request it at my birthday. I was a strange child <laughs> with strange tastes. <laughs> I was eccentric uh, for most of my life. So Marion, I know that we have a, we have a slide of a Linzer tort. Yes. Yes. I channeled oh. my mother's cooking yesterday and I made this linzer tour. It worked perfectly. The recipe is on my website. It has a nut crust almond with cocoa in it and it has a jam filling, raspberry jam. You have to get superior raspberry jam. It's easy to make and delicious. I channeled my mom this morning to make her cottage cheese pancakes. Oh. My, my dad was roly poly. <laughs> and she did this to make locale food. I make them often and serve them with fruit, poached fruit, or yogurt. 
or both. My childhood memories in a white collar, white bread suburb of North London was my family was different. Stood out like a sore thumb. We had rye bread, not white bread, and we had dishes like this. Schnitzel, rouladen, beef stroganoff, beef goulash, Swiss steak. They all have recipes on my website. Swiss steak was my dad's favorite. And stroganoff was my favorite. Linza Tort was a regular at dinner parties. We had lavish dinner parties and cocktail parties for my dad's students. He was a teacher at medical school and I used to hand around the hors d'oeuvres to his handsome students as a teenager. I remember that. She taught me to make apple pie and she made a mean kugelhopf without yeast. It's a light fruit cake and I never perfected it. She wrote the recipe in this folder. I'll show the folder. Shit. So, so um, uh, Mary, we're, we're just getting some uh, uh, questions on the uh, chat line about um, bigger images. Uh, I want to say something. So maybe about this uh, people can see that folder see, a little bit more clearly. Gave it to me on my 21st birthday, and it has typewritten recipes on an electric typewriter. It's mostly cakes, but it includes bananas flambe. Do you want to ask me something, John? Um, I was going to ask you um, about your website, and you have a very poignant piece on your website called Mum and Me. Yes. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. I mentioned that we had a connection uh, in cooking. We were totally different people. I take after my father. He was feisty, emotional, and eccentric and creative, though he was a scientist. I said to my mum once, about eight years ago, she was putting on a coat from Acuiscutum. She dressed classically, and I dress in vintage and flamboyant clothes. Mum said to me, do you like this coat? It was a navy blue coat with a hood. And I, I was waiting to use this line from Roseanne. Mum, I can't believe I spewed forth from your loins. <laughs> and we both laughed. We had a bond in cooking. And I went to London two years before she died. She did, died two years ago, exactly. And I went to her flat with my microphone. 
and she never told me about the Holocaust. It was a taboo subject. And I asked her about it with my microphone and she told me everything. It was healing and I made my peace with her. It's on my website under Mum and Me and it's 30 minutes of Turd <laughs> It is sometimes funny. She minimized her escape and she was in prison in Seattle for not having the right visas and she said it was enjoyable. Yes. Marian, we unfortunately um, maybe people can go onto the your website for that and that's mariancane.com and hear more about that because uh, we we're going to go to questions and answers uh, with people in the audience here. So, Julia, do you have any questions that, that have come up from the audience? Yes, I do. Let me just open them here. Um, are, you, are you able to, to, to give the questions? I will. I'm just going to close this uh, screen so that I can... Oh, all right. Oh, they don't, there we are. Okay. So we have um, quite a few, yes. Yeah. And uh, I'll just, uh, just scrolling through to check what people are asking. Um, okay. One question is, um, Doris, do you make a, ve a vegan challah or a traditional one with eggs? moment I only know the traditional one with eggs. <laughs> okay um, and um, what are some of your suggestions for making challah a bit healthier? Um, Natalie says we make ours each Friday always with white flour. To use uh, half and half so a half unbleached organic white flour, all-purpose flour, and the other half, any flour. Knowing the texture that you're looking for of the dough, you would know how to add a little bit more water to help make it softer. So knowing how to make bread, you would just play around with the proportions. I'm not sure 100% I haven't tried that yet. I've only stuck to the traditional, but I'm very interested to try that as well. And of course, use organic pasture-raised eggs, and then maybe date sugar or honey instead of white sugar, and grapeseed oil instead of canola, of course, or vegetable. Wow, okay. Question for Marion. Do you still make prune souffle from the Joy of Cooking recipe? I once made it uh, from the Joy of Cooking uh, when I wrote a blog post. You can see it on my website. And it was good. It was delicious. Um, we're, so we have a request for you to hold up the, um, the, the your mom's manuscript uh, your recipe book now that we're seeing you in the full screen so some can see it a little bit closer and oh wow that's great. She wrote on it and she typed the recipes on a, an electric typewriter. Well yes you have inserts there and notes I guess. Yeah, I have notes and I've tried to duplicate many of them and they were successful. She has a banana, bananas flambe recipe that is good. I like bananas cooked more than raw. And she has a few fruitcake recipes and carrot cakes and apple pan dowdy. I recommend apple pan dowdy. I have a Facebook page called Sitting in the Kitchen 
where I post recipes and other people post recipes. And Apple Pan Dowdy is on this page. You can ask to join sitting in the kitchen. It's a community page. Right. Wonderful. And Doris, you have a, a website uh, where people can find recipes as well? Uh, yes, I actually started doing videos recently, some fun edited videos of uh, various uh, dishes. And it's chefdorisfin.com and all social media is chefdorisfin. So you can see uh, stories and recipes and pictures and videos. And your, some of your hala recipes are there, are they? I have the hala, pasta, chocolate avocado mousse, a um, couple others. And I'm about to finish editing a how to make clarified butter. Um, when I'm doing these videos, I like to educate people. So it's not like you're, you're sort of watching the Food Network, but because there's no commercials, there's a lot more time to get into a lot more detail. So I do videos the same way I speak. So it's not something that you're going to have. <laughs> so so, you're ready. <laughs> right. It's like being in the kitchen with you. Uh, we, have, we have a question um, with, about whether or not you add raisins to your challah. I personally don't because the challah I make is for my boyfriend and his father when we have Shabbat dinners and for my brother and my, bro my dad is neutral raisins or not, but they like no raisins. So I make it without, but definitely add the raisins, but you wouldn't add it in uh, during the fermentation or the uh, proofing process. You would add them in in the last half an hour of the proofing process so that the sugar doesn't continue to overproof it. Uh, there's various um, theories on this, but try both add the raisins in the beginning of proofing, then at the very end, and see which one you like. And Mary, one more question for you. Um, uh, actually, maybe, maybe both of you want to answer this. A uh, question about the quick Kugelhoff recipe in the joy of cooking with, with eggs, no yeast. And uh, Sarah wonders whether your mom's recipe is based on it. No, it's from a friend of hers called Noshi. <laughs> I knew Noshi. Uh, she was the wife of um, a colleague of my father's. He was a doctor. And it's, I'll put it up on my Facebook page. Can I mention my two daughters? I'm a mother and have two daughters, Ru Esther and Ruth. And they appeared in the star with their favorite food they make. Uh, Esther uh, cooks uh, lemon potatoes and Ruth cooked uh, wheat berry salad. Right. <laughs> Conveyed my passion to cooking for cooking with them. Terrific. Wonderful. Well, John, I'm going to pass it back to you now. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Julia, Julia thank you for doing that. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Marion Kane, is it marionkane.com? Yes. And Chef Doris, where are you? What's your website? Of course, Great. All right. Terrific. Thank you. So on behalf of the Culinary Historians of Canada, I'd like to thank Marianne Kane and Chef Doris Finn for joining us today and sharing thoughts and sentiments about their mothers with us. Thank you. In the meantime, please stay well, please stay strong, and happy cooking. Thank you.